You know that quote from Bill Gates saying that 640k ought to be enough for anyone? Sorry to burst your bubble, but that's an urban legend, and he actually never said that. But that's not going to stop us from shattering this 640k barrier and upgrading this Amstrad CPC from 64k to 1 megabyte. megabyte. That should be enough for anyone, right? The Amstrad CPC 464 was released in 1984 and it came with a whole whopping 64 kilobytes of RAM. I'm actually not kidding, that was a significant amount of RAM at the time. Several other computers at the time also had 64K, like the Commodore 64, Dragon 64, MSX computers, and even some of the 8-bit line of the Atari computers. Later came the Amstrad CPC 6128, doubling the amount of RAM to 128K, which brings us to the first question today. How can an 8-bit computer have more than 64K of RAM? It turns out it's not the 8-bitness of a computer that limits that, but how wide its data bus is. Most 8-bit computers have a 16-bit data bus. That means they can access memory addresses defined with 16 bits, which means 2 to the 16 bytes, which is exactly 64K. So how could the Amstrad CPC 6128 use 128K of RAM? Easy, by cheating. <laughs> Not really, by banking, which is almost the same thing as cheating. The CPU can only address 64 kilobytes, but nothing is stopping a clever computer architect from adding a toggle somewhere and saying, whenever this is on, the computer accesses those other 64K over there, and whenever it's off, it accesses those over there. So it can use 128K of RAM, but only 64K at a time. And really, what I just described would be the world's worst banking system because it would swap all of the memory at once, which makes it very difficult to have any program running in memory and then swapping something and you just lose that program completely. So instead, banking is usually done in smaller blocks. In the case of the Amstrad CPC, and actually a lot of Z80-based computers, it happened in blocks of 16 kilobytes. There are usually some restrictions, but the general idea is that we can toggle some of the 16 kilobyte blocks to map the second set of 64 kilobyte RAM in there. And while that is not as flexible as just being able to access all 128 kilobytes at once, with some careful programming, it's definitely quite usable. I could try to design a RAM expansion from scratch, but instead, I'm going to build one from an existing project. Several years ago, user Revaldino created an add-on card for the Amstrad CPC that adds a full one megabyte of RAM. He made it open source and put everything in GitHub. I really love it when people do that instead of trying to keep things proprietary. Even though the theory of RAM expansion is pretty simple, the actual implementation gets more complicated with lots of little details because it can work on both a 464 computer and a 6128. It offers different kinds of RAM expansion modes and lots of lots of little details. So it makes a lot of sense to just start from there. But actually, I'm not even going to start from that project because some of the components it uses aren't as easy to buy today as they were maybe eight years ago when that was made. So I'm going to use a different project by Rebobinando. He used Revaldino's initial project and updated it to use some more common components. The update is also open source, so it's just a matter of downloading the Gerber files and uploading them directly to PCBWay website, which also happens to be the sponsor of today's video. As usual, you can upload the zipped Gerbers directly to the order page and you don't really have to do anything else. I'll just pick a blue color because I have too many green PCBs around already, select a shipping option and place the order. That easy. While we wait for the PCBs to arrive, let's talk about how that memory expansion could be implemented, all at a very high level. And then we can actually compare it to how it really is implemented in that project and see how we did. One interesting thing to notice is that the concept of RAM banking, like we're talking about here, has nothing to do with the Z80 itself. There's no built-in mechanism in place to swap out RAM addresses or anything of the sort. So anything we do will be done without the Z80 really knowing anything about it. In order to accomplish what we want, we need two main things. We need a way for the software to signal us that we want to swap out one of the banks. And then we need to read the address and return the data from one RAM bank or a different one depending on that signal. The first part is usually accomplished on the Z80 by the use of the OUT instruction. An OUT instruction lets the Z80 signal some bits to the hardware that it has some data available for them. That would let the program write something like this. So it would load some values in B, load another value in C, and then do an OUT C C. And here XX will be the number of the I.O. peripheral we're communicating with, and YY will be some data indicating which RAM bank we want to swap in. It's up to us to pick whatever values we want in there, but if there is a standard already set for that particular platform, you might as well use that. So our hardware needs to listen to the I.O. line and watch out for certain addresses, in this case XX, 
and then read the data bus and remember which RAM banks we want to have mapped. Later, when the CPU does a memory access, we figure out in which RAM bank that RAM lives and we access that particular part of the larger RAM. Since we're doing 16 kilobyte blocks, we can actually just look at the top two bits of the 64 kilobyte address. So 00, 00 means the lower bank, 01 the next one, 10 the third one, and 11 is the top one. So that decoding is actually really simple to do in hardware. It sounds simple, but if you try to implement that out of discrete logic, it ends up being quite a bit. And that's only taking into account the simplest possible case. We still need to deal with read-write differences and potential differences with different models, the 464 and the 6128, so there's quite a bit in there. But wait, the PCB we sent out to be made was pretty small, and it didn't have dozens of chips. So what's going on? Looking at the bill of materials in the GitHub page of the project, we see that it doesn't need much at all. It should be really easy to assemble all of those components, but in my case, I got everything already prepared as a kit that Rebobinando sent me. And this is it. Some capacitors, a voltage regulator, some pins and sockets, two 512K of RAM, and one CPLD. It's the CPLD that is the secret sauce in here. Had we implemented the same expansion but with 74 logic, it would probably would have been closer to the size of a full Amstrad main PCB. Instead, the CPLD combines all of that logic into a tiny stamp-like chip. A CPLD is a programmable chip. The same way that an EEPROM lets you write data to a chip so it can be read later, the CPLD lets you write simple programs so the hardware performs certain functions. In this case, we can do all the logic checking, saving the states of the banks, and setting the right address lines all from within the CPLD. The language used here is Verilog, which is a hardware description language. Even if you don't know the details, and I don't, it's actually relatively easy to follow along, and you can see some of the logic functions performed by different inputs right there. Since time flies when you're having fun, the PCBs just arrived in the mail. And as we imagined from the pictures, it's a tiny PCB, and that is one of the reasons it was so cheap to build. This shouldn't take too long to build, so time to turn on some chiptunes and get soldering. There are a few SMB components here, and for that, I'm gonna try something that I don't usually do. I was sent this tiny, tiny soldering iron by Miniware. This is the TS-80P. I haven't tried it before. It's very different from the other soldering irons that I have because it's powered through USB. So this has a, actually a really nice silicon cable. Since it has such fine points, maybe it will be a good fit for this. So, you know, let's give it a try. Yeah, that was pretty good. It's a it's a nice combination to have with your regular one, your in my case, my big fat one, and then you can use one or the other instead of having to swap points. And speaking of chip tunes, if you like music like the amazing version of Funky Stars playing right now, go check out McLean's Bandcamp page. Most of the music I use comes from his basic 1.1 album. In just a few weeks ago, he released a new album of music he wrote for a bunch of recent games, and it was an insta-buy for me. The last thing I have left to do is solder the connector. The Amstrad CPC has an edge connector for the expansion port, so we could use that, but you almost always want to combine the RAM expansion with other devices for extra ROMs, mass storage, or something of the sort. So in this case, we're gonna use an IDC connector instead. And finally, all we have left to do is put the RAM chips and the CPLD in the sockets. The CPLD was already programmed, which wasn't a bad thing. Programming different CPLDs requires different hardware and environments. I was looking into how to program this one, and you can do it with a Xilinx programming environment, which sounds like a nightmare because you need, I think you need to install all versions of Windows on a virtual machine. You can also go in a different route and program it directly from an Arduino, which sounds a lot more like my speed. But honestly, if this works and I don't have to program it, so much the better. And this is it. If all went well, I should be able to connect it to the Amstrad, turn it on, and test it. However, since we went with the IDC port, I can't connect it directly to the Amstrad that has the edge connector. So instead, I'm gonna use this extension that allows you to plug in any card with IDC connectors. So with it connected, we turn on the Amstrad, and 
Wait, it still says 64K of RAM. It turns out that unlike other computers like the Commodore 64, for example, this number is not calculated when you turn on the computer. This is just hardwiring the ROM. So it could have a lot more than 64K and it's just not going to tell us. So how can we tell that it's working? Well, for starters, the fact that the computer turned on and nothing exploded, that's a good sign. But really, we need a program that counts how much RAM is available on the computer. And for that, we can use the RAM diagnostics program that I wrote a couple of years ago. I have that diagnostics program in a Dendonator, and here we actually have the opposite problem. Now I want to plug in an edge connector expansion, but I only have IDC connectors on the expansion board. So for that, I need to use an adapter. All of this is open source, by the way. You can find these projects open source. You can print them yourself. Same thing with the expansion card. So we should just be able to fit the edge connector like this, and now we can plug it in with an IDC connector. Before we turn it on, we need to talk about power, though. Add-on boards like the memory expansion or the Dendonator usually don't have external power connectors, and that's because all the power they use, they use through the VCC line on the extension board. In theory, that's fine. In practice, if you start chaining a lot of these accessories one after the other, they may end up using too much power, and they need more than that. In this case, the power comes from the monitor and I think it supports up to two amps, so we should be fine with this. But it's something to keep in mind if you have lots of other accessories or one particularly power hungry one. And if so, the extension card comes with an external power supply where you can add an additional five volt power. For now, let's just try it without anything special and see if it works. And if not, we'll do something about it. Okay, it looks like it's fine. The detonator menu comes up perfectly fine. And now we can go into the diagnostics test and if all goes well, it should tell us the total. There we go. So we have RAM, actually it says 1088 kilobytes. So that it detects more than the megabyte. I didn't realize that at first, but of course that is the full megabyte we just added plus the 64 kilobytes of the base system. So yeah, that's perfect. It detected everything. Now we can do an upper RAM test and it will go through every byte in that one megabyte of memory and make sure that it works correctly. This is actually a great test to run as an example, to give us to get a sense of a scale, because I know that one megabyte doesn't sound like much to us right now, but one megabyte is a lot for an 8-bit computer. So this poor four megahertz Z80 processor is accessing every byte in one megabyte of RAM and is reading and writing from it probably about four times per uh, byte. And that is taking a long time. It's doing nothing but reading and writing. And it's probably gonna take a couple of minutes. So yeah, one megabyte is actually a lot for an 8-bit computer to handle. So perfect, it looks like all the tests passed for the upper RAM and the memory is fine. So that's great news. Now we have an Amstrad CPC that initially had 64 kilobytes of RAM and now has one megabyte of RAM. So 16 times as much RAM as it shipped with. So now we can finally ask the question, why do we need this much RAM? It's not like we're gonna be running MS-DOS or Windows on an 8-bit computer. And that's true, but we have some fun things we can try. So what can we run that needs that much memory? The truth is, not a huge amount of things. See, the Amstrad was only released with 64K of RAM, and later with 128K in the 6128 model. There were a few RAM expansions sold back in the day, but they were never very popular, so they were never supported from games or normal software. I would say that 95% of Amstrad software released during its lifetime worked just on 64K of RAM. Some of it used 128K, and a lot of times it was even optional. So nothing from back then requires more than 128K, as far as I know, but a few programs could make use of more memory. Some of the programs that make best use of the extra RAM are copy programs. Back in the day, my favorite one, my go-to copy program was Discology, and it makes great use of the extra RAM. We're not gonna get too much into why I was using Discology so much. <clears throat> the Amstrad CPC uses three inch disks, and each of them have about 180 kilobytes per side. If you didn't have a second disk drive or a RAM expansion, you'd be forced to swap the source and destination disks about every 40 kilobytes or even less. With the extra RAM, you could definitely minimize the amount of swapping. And if you had a whole 256 kilobytes, I think you would be able to load a whole side in memory and then write it onto the destination disk. Of course, all of that is moot if you had two disk drives, because then it would be able to just automatically load a small section and then save it to the destination disk. But back in the days, two disk drives was not a very common setup at all. 
And actually, you know what else doesn't have two disk drives? This computer. This one doesn't even have a single disk drive. This particular case of using Discology would not be applicable here unless we added an external disk drive. Another very good example of programs that could make use of extra RAM are productivity applications. It makes a lot of sense that if you're doing something like a word processor or a database, you want to have more data than just the about 40 kilobytes that you have left on the computer after the screen memory and the program memory itself. A lot of those programs like the word processor WordStart would run under CPM, which already needed 128 kilobytes of RAM to run. So they would definitely need some kind of RAM upgrade to even be able to run on this 464 model. Those of us without a RAM expansion back in the day, we would be forced to break up our long word processor documents into multiple files. I remember having to do that for some long paper at school, and I ended up having to do three or four different files to be able to use it, otherwise it wouldn't fit in memory all at once. Drawing programs can also really benefit from extra RAM. And surprisingly, I did some research and I don't think there were any drawing programs back in the day that could use more than 128 kilobytes of RAM. However, one of the best programs on the Amstrad CPC, the Advanced OCP Art Studio, and I love this one back in the day, was patched after, really after the commercial life of the Amstrad in 1993 was patched to be able to make use of extra memory. I think all you can do is store multiple screens but still, it could be really useful to swap between multiple layers really quickly, copy things back and forth, compare things. So I think it makes it much more usable just having that extra expansion. But really, the kind of applications that benefit the most from the extra RAM are probably development programs. The first way development environments try to make more room is by releasing programs as a ROM. Maxim, a very popular assembler, used this strategy. This made it so the editor and assembler programs would be instantly accessible in ROM memory but wouldn't take any RAM space. That still leaves both the source code and the binary program created from it in RAM though, so it's not perfect. As a bonus of setting up things that way, if you reset the CPU but don't turn off the power to the computer, you would wipe the system 64 kilobytes of RAM, but it would leave the expansion RAM untouched. So that would be great because if you're debugging your program and it crashes or maybe you don't have a way to cleanly exit, you can just reset it and when you come back, all your development environment is still loaded in RAM in this exact same way that you left it. So that is super handy. However, just because that's all there was during the commercial life of the Amstrad doesn't mean that's all there is now. As we well know, people keep writing software for a platform after it's not considered commercially viable anymore. And because of that, since they're not making money from those projects, they'll sometimes target add-ons that very few people have. Sometimes those add-ons with the years and the existence of replicas and new versions like this memory expansion, they become commonplace and most of the new software end up using that. That happened a bit with the VIG-20, maybe because the original platform is so limited in RAM. It seems that most people today are targeting expanded VIG-20s. The Amstrad CPC, however, already had 64K and expansion cards were never a common thing. So most software doesn't require or even support extra RAM even to this day. But that's just most software. There are things out there that people have developed that will gladly use that much RAM and maybe even more. The best examples of programs that can use lots of RAM are custom operating systems. The Amstrad CPC shipped with AMSDOS, which can be accessed from BASIC, and it offers super limited set of file operations. The Amstrad CPC 6128 also shipped with the operating system CPM, which offer a much more comprehensive suite of commands to format disks and move files around. But since then, people have written their own operating systems for the Amstrad and other 8-bit computers. One of those is Future OS. This is a graphical operating system that relies on mouse or joysticks or keys for those of us without a mouse on the Amstrad. I know it looks a bit odd compared to modern GUI environments, but that's because future OS actually goes back to the late 80s. Development started before a lot of the conventions were set for windowed environments, and I guess they just stuck to their guns. It may seem like a clunky graphical front end for doing some disk operations, but it's actually more than that. It offers APIs to programs running under future OS to access disk functions, real-time clocks, and of course, memory expansions. Unlike AMSDOS, it supports mass storage mediums like hard drives or the M4 add-on. It's not a surprise that it can use quite a bit of RAM because people offer underestimate how much memory it takes to be able to interact with a deep hierarchy of files and folders in a hard drive. That easily blows 64 kilobytes of RAM. There's a lot to explore with FutureOS, and I'm not going to get into it here. If you're interested in seeing a dedicated video about it, let me know, and maybe it's something I can do in the future. But I'm going to run one of the games he comes with, a tribute to the sisters. 
This is an obvious remake of the great Gianna Sisters game, but taking full advantage of the Amstrad hardware. It may not seem like much, but this right here is using mode zero with overscan. The normal screen area on an Amstrad CPC is 16 kilobytes, which is incidentally one of those blocks that we can swap in and out. This is doubling that to achieve an overscan effect using 32 kilobytes right there just for the screen alone. But those are the luxuries you can afford when you have a one megabyte RAM expansion. Another modern OS on the Amstrad CPC is Symbios. This one is a more modern project, so it looks a bit more recognizable to us as a Windows environment. Apart from menus and windows, it offers the usual features of memory management, disk functions, and even preemptive multitasking. Oh, and it's not even limited to the Amstrad. Symbios actually runs on MSX, Amstrad PCW, Enterprise Computers, and Amstrad NC, which all incidentally are Z80 machines. That is really impressive. So how expensive was this expansion? It was surprisingly cheap. The PCBs were 10 for $10, including shipping, and the components can probably be bought for about $10. So for $20 plus some time soldering, you can put together this awesome expansion, which I think is very worth it if you're thinking of using the Amstrad as a development machine, or you want to create something new that uses more RAM. Hint, hint. If in the 80s you had told me I could upgrade my Amstrad CPC to one megabyte of RAM, I, I would think you're just joking. Back then, the only thing measuring megabytes were hard drives, and even that was only starting to trickle down into the consumer market. All computer memory and even disks were just measured in kilobytes. As an aside, I always crack up when I remember that my first ever hard drive on a PC in 1988 was 10 megabytes. That helps keep things in perspective when I pull out a 64 gigabyte mini SD card to record this video. And frankly, it's a shame that more things aren't taking advantage of this much RAM. The Amstrad CPC got the raw end of the stick during the commercial life because it was one of the 8-bit computers with most potential, but I feel it got stuck with bad or lazy Spectrum ports because of economics. If you look at the software being developed for it today, it's in a whole different level. If developers started taking advantage of this much RAM, I feel we could see another big jump in the complexity and quality of the games being made for it. On the other hand, it doesn't surprise me too much that this isn't very common, because it's kind of a pain to pull out the expansion board, attach this, attach something else, maybe having to power the expansion board because it's drawing too much power, and all those things involved with that. I still think there is potential for a RAM expansion that drops in internally, replacing the RAM chips on the board. It would also bring both the 464 and the 6128 models to the same amount of RAM and unify them so they can be developed for at the same time. So who knows, maybe I'll have to do that project myself in the near future after some other project ideas that I already have in mind. But that will have to be in another video. Until then, see you next time.